systems. As the executive system is developing, we are going to progressively move to controlling our behavior by mental events, private information, our thoughts, our words. So children, as they develop, go from control by external events around them to gradually being controlled by what they think, what they want, what they wish to do, their goals. That's a very important change in human behavior. The second transition is that three-year-olds are largely being controlled by others around them. They don't have any self-control, as we all know, right? But over the next 30 years, using this mental information, they're going to develop self-control. I can guide my own actions. I don't need other people doing that for me. And I'm doing it through those seven mental executive functions, that mental information. So we go from control by others to self-control. Now those two transitions lead to the third one. The three-year-old is only concerned with the now, the momentary events around them. They have no concept of the future, of what comes next at the end of the day or tomorrow or next week. This ability to think about a future and to juxtapose the later with the now, they don't have that. So they are stuck in the moment, right? But as we develop our executive system, we are going to start looking ahead further and further in time to anticipate the future and get ready for it so we can succeed at dealing with it. We're going to direct behavior forward in time. The older we are, the further out we can do this. That leads to the last transition. Little children are controlled by immediate consequences. What can they earn right now? But as this sense of the future and this window on time begins to open, right, we begin to get motivated by delayed consequences, the later events, the larger rewards that are delayed in time. And they become more important to us than the little bitty rewards that we can earn right now for what we do. So these are important transitions to think about because ADHD is going to delay them by 30 to 40%. So that the person with ADHD is going to be more on the left side of this diagram than on the right side. They're not developing properly. <clears throat> Here's a way to think about it. Right here, we have a typical person. As this person develops as a child, they can start to look ahead in time, maybe just a few minutes, maybe a few hours as they get older. So that by eight or nine or 10, they can think about a half a day ahead in their life. And that's what they're thinking about and talking to you about. And that's when they tell you that they need supplies for school tomorrow is the night before. But as they become adolescents, they can begin to think about things two to three days ahead. And as they become older adolescents and young adults, they can look out two to three weeks ahead and begin to plan and prepare for those events. And by the time we reach our early 30s, we are looking out eight to 12 weeks on average. We can look further ahead for some things, lesser for others. But on average, the decisions that people make in adulthood, they are making with regard to events over the next two to three months. That's what a typical person does when they develop from childhood to adulthood. Here's what an ADHD person looks like. So as they develop, they don't get the window on time as early as other people. And when they do get it, it's smaller. The window isn't as open as wide. They can't look out ahead as far as other people of the same age. And as they become adolescents and then they become adults, they're only looking out much closer in time than other adults are looking in their life. So they don't prepare for events as far ahead in time as other people do. And they don't manage their time as well as other people do. That's why they're always late. They're never ready. They're disorganized. It all has to do with this ability to look ahead 
and get ready and plan and accomplish our goals on time. Now, it's important for people, educators, parents, and clinicians to understand that the executive brain probably has a limited capacity, a limited strength or pool of resources. Think of it like a fuel tank in a car, right? So there's only so much fuel in the tank. And if we use our executive functions too much, too quickly, and have to sustain them over time for a long period of time, look at what happens to the fuel tank. It gets depleted. So that by the time right, we've had to do this for such a long time, we're mentally exhausted. And that means we don't have the capacity for self-control we had when we started. Our executive functions have been weakened. And we'll find that, therefore, our self-control is a little weak for a while until we can replenish the fuel tank. And then we can engage in normal self-control again. Now, the idea that the executive brain has a limited resource capacity is debatable. Some people don't think that that's true. I happen to think that the research is pretty convincing that it is true. But to me, it helps us to understand that you can't stress and tax and utilize the executive system for a very long period of time without exhausting it. And then the person needs a little time away from these tasks that are so taxing in order to replenish their self-regulation. So it's kind of like when the child comes home at the end of the school day, their executive system is a little exhausted. They need time to play, have a snack, enjoy some entertainment, or just chill out and relax and not think of anything in particular and certainly not have to do any mental work that involves goals. They need time to replenish their resources of their self-control. And I think that's very important for us all to understand in working with children and especially working with children with ADHD because they exhaust their fuel tank much faster because they don't have as much fuel in the tank to begin with. So, so let's take a look at how this explains ADHD then. I've said that there is an executive system, right? <clears throat> and that the executive functions are self-regulation. So executive functioning is one thing, self-control, right? But we can split it into two major types of self-control, inhibition and executive attention, what many scientists call metacognition, right? So we have these two things, right? We have executive attention, metacognition, and we have self-restraint, inhibition. Now, we can take these two dimensions and break them down further into little subdimensions, components. So inhibition, as I've explained, is of several types. Motor inhibition, verbal inhibition, inhibition of thought and motivation, and inhibition of emotion. Over here, as I explained, we can take executive attention, as I did at the beginning of this lecture, and we can break it down into nonverbal working memory, visual imagery, verbal working memory, talking to yourself, planning and problem solving, and emotion regulation. Now, how does ADHD fit into all of this? It should be obvious by now. The hyperactive impulsive dimension of the symptoms is a subset of the inhibitory problem that we've already described. And the inattention symptoms, as we think of them in our diagnostic manual, are really executive attention symptoms or metacognitive symptoms. And that's how ADHD fits in. And that's why I think ADHD is really an executive function disorder, but we've simply misnamed it. The two dimensions that we think of as making up the ADHD symptoms are really two dimensions of executive functioning. And we need all of them in order to self-regulate. We also know this because the stimulant medications and uh, other interventions improve both of these dimensions of behavior. <clears throat> so let's take a look at what this means for you as a parent, a teacher, a clinician, 
uh, professional. Uh, what are the implications of this theory? Right? This theory says that we can think of the brain as having two parts. There's the back part of the brain, which is not the executive brain. It's where we learn things. It's where we store knowledge and information. There is the front part of the brain, which you now know is the executive brain. That is where we do things. That is where we hold our knowledge in mind in order to use it. We put our knowledge into play. Information comes forward into the brain to guide behavior. So we have the knowledge brain and the performance brain. And ADHD splits them in half so that they don't talk to each other very well so that the knowledge we have can't go forward to control what we do as effectively as it should. The knowing brain and the doing brain are partially disconnected. That means that people with ADHD pretty much know what other people know of their age and know what to do, but they can't do it. They can't use what they know, where they should have done so, when they should have done so, to guide their behavior, to change themselves. So it means that ADHD is not a problem with knowledge. It's a problem with performance. It's not a problem of knowing what to do for the most part. It's a problem of using what you know, of doing it out there in time, at that place in time, where you should have used that information, and you didn't. We call that, by the way, the point of performance. So ADHD disrupts all seven executive functions I've described to you in this lecture, all of them, so that the person with ADHD is going to be delayed in developing them. And that means that all five of those daily life executive functions, like time management, self-motivation, and so on, are going to be very delayed. They're going to have a self-regulation problem. It means that because the executive function is the look-ahead brain, the brain that anticipates the future, the person with ADHD is blind to the future. They have what we call a time blindness. They can't look ahead. They can't govern themselves relative to time very well. And as a result, they're stuck in the now. They live in the moment, and they don't get ready for the things that lie ahead because they can't anticipate the things that lie ahead. They have what we call a temporal myopia, a time blindness. And this is going to affect their ability to put together long chains of actions to accomplish goals. You call it a short attention span. I think of it as an inability to persist over time to keep your actions toward the goal. And they can't do that. So they skip from one thing to another, and they have these little short chains of actions, but they can't string it all together to sustain it over time to accomplish a goal. Thinking about the future is thinking about our intentions. Because people with ADHD don't attend to the future, they really have an intention deficit disorder, not an attention disorder. They can attend to the now just fine. That's the problem. That's all they're thinking about and looking at is the now. But as we develop, we look ahead. We attend to that future. We develop intentions, plans, goals, and actions to accomplish the goals. And they can't do that. So I think of ADHD as IDD, intention deficit disorder. So as I've said, one of the most important insights to come out of this model is not only are they time blind, right? It's that they know but can't do. They can't perform. ADHD is not a problem with knowledge. It's a problem of doing what you know, a problem with using what you know when and where out there in the real world where it matters. And it's not a matter of how do I do it? What do I do? So all of this means that we have to stop spending so much time teaching knowledge and skills to kids with ADHD because that's not really what they need. That's not their failure. Their failure is that they can't take the things they already know and use them wisely in their life at key places in the flow of life where it would have mattered 
they would have been more successful had they done so. <clears throat> and we call those places in the flow of our lives the point of performance. And so what have we learned? All treatment has to be at that point of performance. Where is the problem occurring? That's where treatment needs to be. I'll come back and talk about that in just a moment. But a third insight that comes out of this lecture, out of looking at ADHD as executive functioning, is this. We have a chronological age, a physical age of how we develop physically, but we also have an executive age. And in ADHD, the executive age, the age of self-regulation, is about 30 to 40 percent delayed from your chronological physical age. To put it another way, if a 10-year-old child has ADHD, they have the self-regulation, the executive functions of someone three years younger, more like a seven-year-old. That's a very important idea. Just, excuse me, just like children with dyslexia or reading disability can't read at their age level, they read like a younger child, and so we have to adjust our expectations and reconstruct our tasks for the younger reader. We can't ask them to read at grade level. The same thing happens in ADHD. We cannot ask the ADHD child to show the self-control of someone their age, a 10-year-old, for instance. What we have to do is change the tasks, change the environment, and reorganize it around them as if they were seven. And then it works. So one implication then is that ADHD delays <clears throat> executive development and leaves you with about a 30% delay in your executive age. So what does that mean? It means that we as adults have to adjust our demands, our assignments, our instructions, our expectations to someone much younger. I don't mean all of our expectations, but our expectations for self-control, for persistence, for inhibition, for organization, and time management. We are dealing with a much younger child here we're the ones that have to change instead of castigating and judging the child harshly and demanding that they act like a normal person. They can't. It's impossible, right? That means you're the problem. When you ask them to behave normally, you're the problem. You don't get it. You need to get it, to understand that ADHD delays that executive age. And my job is to redesign the tasks and the situation for somebody with a younger executive age. Then they will succeed, right? So we need to think about this all the time. When we ask ourselves, should I let the ADHD child do this? Should I give them several hours of school homework every night? Should I let them as a teenager learn to drive a car? Should I allow my daughter at 15 or 16 to start dating men, right? Now that she is sexually developing, what do I do? Well, the executive age lesson here tells you, no, you need to rethink this. You have someone whose executive age is much, much younger. So you might be 16 years of age, but if you have ADHD, you're like an 11 year old. So no, I'm not going to let you learn to drive a car independently. And if I have a daughter who's 16, she has the executive control, the self-control of an 11-year-old. I'm not going to allow you to date as a couple, as other people might do. Even though you're sexually mature, you don't have the self-control of somebody who is 16 years of age and so on. And if the school says you have to do an hour or two of homework each night, at your home and you're 10 years of age, well, then the school is wrong because they can't do that. They can't sustain themselves and organize themselves and persist at that amount of homework. We have to break it down and change it to fit their executive age. So notice, look at all the different expectations we have that we now have to go back and reevaluate and alter them and then change the situation to help them show what they know. So to summarize,